Stanford University. Lecture 14 of Stanford CS 193P, spring of 2021. Today we're going to go look at that code that uh, has our at sign main in there, the main app, and try and understand a little bit more how scenes work. And that's going to lead us right into talking about the document architecture in Swift UI. So this is a document like emoji art. Clearly you want to create different works of emoji art. And so each thing wants to have its own file and we want to be able to rename those files and all those things. And Swift UI has a very powerful mechanism for just taking care of all that stuff for you. And we're going to learn all about that today. So let's start by talking about this app protocol that you saw in your at sign main there. You're only going to have one struct in your app that conforms to this protocol, obviously. Uh, and it has a var body. This var body is some scene. So we've got to understand what these scenes are. A scene is a container for a top level view that you want to show in your UI. Now, it is possible to create your own scenes, which they in turn have their own var bodies. Uh, but this would be rare, however. You're unlikely to do this. You might do it if for some reason you want to be monitoring this environment variable called scene phase, which is basically whether your app is in the foreground or it's in the background, etc. cetera. Uh, but normally you're not gonna need to do this. Most of the time you're just gonna use one of the two main Swift UI scene building scenes. And those are window group and document group with a new document. And there's also document group for just viewing documents, read only documents. Now these window group and document group are a little bit like for each's okay for scenes but we're not for eaching over an array or something like that instead each of these things that's created in the for each is created by the user either by creating new window on mac or you can split the screen on an ipad on an iphone these four each's are only ever going to do there for each thing once because there's only one scene on the iPhone that fills the entire uh, screen. So these screens have the green content argument up there that you see, and that is going to return some view, and that some view that returns is going to fill the entire scene. This green content closure there is called or executed for every scene. So every new window on the Mac, when you split the screen on the iPad, you get a second one and an iPhone uh, is just the first, that first scene that fills the whole screen. Window group is the basic non-document oriented scene building scene. This is what we've been using so far in both Memorize and Emoji Art. And you'll remember that it has this little thing, uh, window group right there. And inside we just put the view that we wanted to see on our screen. Now note that in this particular kind of code here, we are sharing that view model game amongst all the scenes that might be created. And again, on iPad, there might be two side by side, or on the Mac, there might be multiple windows. Now, if that's not what we want there, then that at sign state object maybe wants to be inside emoji memory game view. Remember that if you put an at sign state object in a view, its lifetime is tied to the lifetime of the view, which might be what you want here. If you wanted every view to have its own view model, that might be uh, the way you want to structure your app. Now I'm going to talk about the other uh, scene building scene thing, which is document group. Uh, in a little bit, but first I want to talk about a, a few property wrappers, uh, kind of related, not so very related, but somewhat related property wrappers, and then I'm going to do a demo, and then I'll come back to the slides to talk about document group, which is a document-oriented uh, scene building scene thing. The first property wrapper I want to talk about is at sign scene storage. This stores information, usually simple information, persistently on a per scene basis. That means they stick around even if the app is killed or if the user just quits it or something like that. This is per scene, so on the Mac it's per window and on the iPad it's per part of the screen if you have split your screen. Changes to an at sign scene storage var invalidate the view just like an at sign state would, so your body's gonna get rebuilt uh, if they change. Uh, there are significant restrictions on the type of things you can store in at sign scene storage, like 
basically strings and ints are mostly about it, a little bit more than that. Uh, but there is a general data type you can store, uh, which is things that implement the protocol raw representable. And rather than just showing this in the slides, uh, I will show you this in the demo so you can see what that looks like. I'm going to do it for CG size and CG float, which normally wouldn't be able to be stored in scene storage, but we're going to make them raw representable and then they will be able to. Now there's another similar property wrapper called outsign app storage. Now this is also storing stuff that's persistent, you know, when your app gets killed or quit or whatever, it stays there, but this is app wide. This is not a per scene uh, type of storage. We generally refer to that scene storage stuff as state restoration, essentially, because you're going to restore the state of your application from when you had it quit or killed. Whereas app storage, it's just essentially just user defaults. It's kind of an uh, interface to user defaults. But app storage does invalidate your view when you change it. So in that sense, you can use it in the same places that you would use at sign state, for example, but it just persists. A third property wrapper I'm going to mention really doesn't go along with this app and scene stuff, but uh, it's a property wrapper that I think is important for you to know, and I'm going to demo it alongside these other things. So this is a little bit of an aside, but scaled metric is uh, essentially a property wrapper that scales its var up and down with the user's system-wide font preference. You can go, I don't know if you know, you can go into your settings app on your device and you can change your fonts to be bigger, which, you know, people, people like me, they like that. We don't have to get our glasses out sometimes to read the tiny text uh, on the screen. And that's great, but if you have something in your app that is not using just the built-in fonts, then they won't get scaled. So SwiftUI scales everything normally, but you know not everything gets scaled. For example, in emoji art, we have our little default emoji size for the little palette chooser at the bottom. That's a fixed value. We set it to 40 points, I think. And so when we adjust the size of our font, that's not going to adjust. All the rest of the fonts in our emoji art app will adjust, but that particular one is a fixed variable. So we have to have that variable scale with the font size uh, in our settings. And so we're going to learn how to do that. In fact, let's do that right now. Let's jump into the demo and take a look at window group and the scene storage and uh, also the scale metric. We're going to spend some time now looking at this app, the scene business going on here and what's happening. But before we do that, let's give our app an icon. See, our app has this blank graph paper icon here. It's a lot of fun to give your app an icon, even for your final project. Maybe you'll do it right at the beginning of your final project just to have a fun icon right here to look at as you're working. How do we do that? Well, we actually saw how to do this right at the very beginning of the quarter with this assets.exe assets thing. When you open that up and click on this app icon section, you see there's all these various different size icons from tiny little 40 by 40 all the way up to 1024 by 1024. Some of these are for the iPad in different situations and some for the iPhone in different situations. And you really, if you were shipping an app on the App Store, you would want to make sure these all looked good at all these resolutions. You might even hire a graphic artist to design you an icon and then tweak it to look really good. When you're just doing development, a lot of times you'll just take a really large one like this, and there's a bunch of apps on the Mac App Store, which will scale it to all these other sizes. So I used one of those, and here is my folder full of them. If you look in here, it's got app icons of all these different sizes. And the cool thing is you can just take this output of these apps and drag it right into your assets. And here I go, I now have my app icon right here that has my app icon in all those various sizes. Now I've chosen an app icon here, which you probably think is really cool. This is the emoji for a paint palette. And you're like, ooh, good idea. That's a great idea for an app icon. Uh, actually, this is a terrible idea for an app icon. If I submitted this to the App Store, it would be rejected before they even ran my app. And that's because this artwork right here that does this, this is not owned by me, designed by me. This is designed by Apple. This is their take on the palette emoji. So 
seems like a good idea, but actually a terrible idea. But it's great for a demo because it's really easy to put together. Now, if you drag the folder in and it's not called app icon, like this one for me is called app icon iOS, you need to go to your project settings over here and under the general tab of your target, go down to where it says app icons and launch images and change the app icon source to be app icon iOS or whatever the name of the folder you dragged in. Because otherwise, it's going to be over here looking at app icon and oh, don't have any icons. Now, as soon as I did that, notice that, look, I'm even seeing my icon already right here. Now, I'm not seeing it on my simulator yet, but as soon as I run, we'll see if we go back to the main area here that I've got an icon. And it's also showing up in the little quick doc bar right here. And so that's kind of cool. It's kind of fun. All right, so let's get back to our Emoji Art app over here. And take a look at this code and see what's going on in here. This is seems like a very little amount of code, and it is a very little amount of code you have to write, but this is doing a lot of work behind the scenes in Swift UI. And let's take a kind of take it apart piece by piece here. See that we've got a struct that has to implement this app protocol. Very simple protocol. The main thing in it is this var body which is some scene, not some view, but some scene. And a scene is just a high level container that contains the top level view of your application. Now, these scenes are a little different per platform. And you can have multiple scenes in your app. Now, this is easy to imagine on the Mac. Each window that you have in your Mac is its own little scene. Very, very simple. And on the iPhone, this is actually easy to imagine as well, because on the iPhone, you only have one top level scene. Your entire app is one top level scene. On the iPad, you might not even realize what's going on there with scenes. But watch this, I've got this. Of course, this is my first scene that it created when my app was run. It created a scene that filled the whole screen, kind of like an, it would on an iPhone. But if I drag this thing up from the bottom, we know that I could pick up this uh, Safari and drag it out and put it side by side so I could do drag and drop. But did you know you can drag your own app out there and have two scenes of your same app? And you can even resize them, one small, one large. And double tap here, double tap here to size them and move this around. I can resize this one. We can go to different palettes over here than we're going to over here. This is two different scenes. And this window group right here manages these for you so that when you drag your app out again, you get two of these scenes. So this is the app running once, one time the app is running. It's got two different scenes, two different emoji art document views. And that's because this window group, when you drag out a second scene or create a new window on the Mac, it runs this closure again. So this closure gets run every time it's creating one of these scenes. And what does our closure do? Well, it returns an emoji art document view. So each of these scenes has its own emoji art document view. However, they are currently sharing a view model. This is the source of truth for the view model right here, this at sign state object right here. And we're passing it to both the views. This closure got run twice, once for this side, once for this side, and we pass the view model to both of them. So they are both using the exact same view model, which is probably okay in this circumstance, not really a problem. When we start doing multiple documents in Emoji Art, however, that's not gonna work. We have multiple documents with different you know, storage on disk for each of them, they're gonna to want to each have their own view model. And you're gonna see that when we switch this to a document group, which is the document oriented version of all this, we're gonna have exactly that, different view models per scene. Now the palette store here is also shared. We inject it with this environment object into both of the views that get created. So this is a shared palette store. and having these two view models be shared means, for example, you know, here's a palm tree. Let's add another palm tree on the horizon up here, a little tiny one. It added it in both places. If we go over here, zoom in, oh, got it on this side too, because we are seeing the same document through the same view model here. And same thing with our palettes. If we go over here to our palettes and go to the manager, for example, 
And let's say edit it and get rid of weather. This is weather over here. Boop. Delete it gone on this side because this palette store is being shared on both sides as well. Now, likely we do want that. Even with multiple documents, we probably do want to share our palette store amongst all of our documents. So we get to mix and match, pick which things we want to share and which things we don't want to share. So that's pretty much all there is to this main app, unless we're doing document oriented app, which we'll go back to the slides and explain first, and then I'll come back in here and we'll change this window group to a document group. But while I'm doing this little demo, let's talk about a couple other things. One thing I wanna talk about is this little thing down here where we're choosing our palette that we wanna look at at a given time. If I were to quit my app, which, you can do by just dragging up and then swiping it out. I killed that app. It even will stop it running here. If I run it back again, it comes back. These things are sized to fit and we're back to faces down here. So if I'm a user and I was over here working on whatever it was, music or whatever, if my app quits or crashes, hopefully never does that, but if it did and I run it again, it'd be nice if I was right back where I was. And same thing for how much I'm zoomed in. If I were working on these palm trees here, I wouldn't want it to come back and be zoomed out if my app got killed. So how do we preserve the state of our application here to match whatever the state was when it was killed or quit? It's really easy to do. We're just gonna mark any variables that we wanna preserve the state of with that at sign scene storage that we talked about. So let's do it for the palette first. I'm gonna make it so that it remembers which palette we're working on here, even if we quit our app. So that's happening in the palette chooser over here. It's our chosen palette index, which is currently at sign state. So it's per view state, it's temporary state. It's just remembering it while we're using this view, but we can make it permanent state and per scene by just changing this at sign state to say scene storage. Now the scene storage takes an argument, which is just a unique string to identify it in the scene storage. I'm gonna call this my palette chooser dot chosen palette index. I kind of like to pick the same unique string here as the full name of my variable here. But you don't have to, but you wanna pick something that's unique inside the whole scene. That's all we have to do to make this scene storage work this way. It still behaves like an at sign state in that when it changes, or, you know, somewhere in our code, we change this thing, it's gonna invalidate our view and cause our body to get redrawn, all that happens. It just remembers it on a per scene basis. So here we go, it comes up. We've got faces right here on both sides. Let's choose COVID on this side and how about weather or something, music on this side. I'm gonna quit this app and run it again. And then COVID and music, it remembered it this time. It didn't go back to faces there. Okay, so let's do the same thing for the zooming and panning here of our documents on both sides. We store that uh, zooming and panning over here in our emoji art document view in these two steady state bars, right? The steady state zoom scale and the steady state pan offset. So let's just make these instead of being at sign state, scene storage, we'll give them a nice name, emoji art document view dot steady state zoom scale for this one. And for the other one, we'll call it the steady state pan offset. Now these two are a little bit different actually than the one we saw in the palette chooser over here, chosen palette index. And what's different about them is that CG size and up here, CG float are not usually things you can put in scene storage. Scene storage is mostly just string in really basic types. But there is one type of thing that you can put in scene storage, which is pretty flexible, which is a raw representable. So let's 
what is a raw representable? A raw representable is essentially just any type that you can convert into a basic type, like a string. And so I had to add a little bit of code in our utility extensions over here. And I'm saying here that I'm adding an extension to CG size that makes it conform to raw representable. But there's no code in here. Same thing here, CG float. It implements raw representable, but there's no code. How is this possible? Well, this makes it possible. Here I've extended the raw representable protocol only in the case where self is codable, which is true for CG size and CG float, to implement the default implementations essentially for the raw value and init raw value, which is the main two things in the raw representable protocol. And I implement them as strings, and I just JSON encode and JSON decode to make strings out of them. Now, if you don't really see what I'm doing here, uh, don't worry about it. We haven't really talked about raw representable. It's just a simple protocol that lets you turn something to and from some basic type. But if you need to put something in scene storage that is not an int or a string, and that thing is codable, which a lot of the things you might want to put in there are, then just drop this in your code and put this little extension on there for anything that you want to put in there and to say CG point or something else, you can do this and that will make these things raw representable. And once they're raw representable, now they can be put in scene storage. So that's that. Let's see if this works. Let's uh, zoom this one way in to look at our rocket. And uh, let's zoom this one way out to be really tiny. Quit our app right here and rerun. Oh no, it reset them. Why did it reset them? It didn't seem like this scene storage worked here. Well, actually scene storage did work. The problem here is right up here. We added this last time we're on receive when we got our background image changes, oh no, we zoomed to fit. So every time our app launches, we fetch our background image and its URL, we're zooming to fit. So that's no good right here. How are we going to fix this problem? Well, now that we have that scene storage, we don't really need to zoom to fit when our document first opens. So let's create a little private state here called auto zoom. It starts out false. And we'll only do this zoom to fit if auto zoom is true. Then the only time we really do want to auto zoom is any time we drop a new background. So here we'll turn our auto zoom on in that case. So now we're only going to auto zoom to this little auto zoom thing when we get a new background image published to us and we are in auto zooming mode. Let's see if that fixes the problem. It did. We didn't get the auto zoom, so it was looking at the scene storage here. And we can do the opposite. Let's zoom this one way out and instead have this one zoomed way in. We can move them around to different spots and then quit and start it up again. And they remember them and it's remembering the chosen index as well. So this state is being remembered even if we quit our app. Another kind of state that can be really good to keep is where the user is navigated to. If you have an application with a lot of navigation views and you're navigating around remembering where the user was when their app was killed or whatever, and when they come back, uh, it's really, it really can be valuable, especially uh, on iPhone, you'll find that. All right, well, as I mentioned in the slides, uh, I'm gonna cover a topic here, which is not, really have anything to do with scene storage or scenes or any of that. But uh, yeah, we got to fit it in somewhere. And uh, we're here in a demo, we might as well show it right now. And that is a scaled metric. What's that all about? Well, in our application right here, if we go over to our settings, this is the general settings for the entire uh, device. Uh, under uh, settings, there's an accessibility area we can change our display size. 
This allows us to make our text larger. For example, we could take really big fonts. And this is great for visually impaired people and also even just older people like me don't want to have to use our glasses. So we want these fonts to be big. Now, when we set this to a large size font and go back to our app, it actually has adjusted. Look at that. And not just there, but in our menus, everything, nice larger fonts. And that happens automatically in Swift. It's really a great feature. However, I don't know if you noticed, but it didn't work for these emojis. These little emojis stayed little. How come these didn't get big like everything else? And why do these not scale? Well, that is because in our code over here in the palette chooser, actually we do this in emoji document view even, we have set our default emoji side here to be a specific size 40. And we're using that size 40. So this is going to be 40 points here. No matter what, it is not going to react. These kinds of fonts over here are things like that dot caption or dot large title or dot body, these built-in fonts, and they automatically scale. But when you create a system font of a particular size, like we're doing right here, this, this size of 40, it's going to be 40. However, we can very easily have this scale just by doing this at sign scaled metric. If we make this an at sign scaled metric instead of just a let, a constant here, then it will scale. And this works not just for font sizes, but you can actually scale up anything you want. Now, essentially, the larger the fonts we make, the larger this number is going to become, and vice versa if we make the fonts really small. So let's see that in action. You can see it happening already here. We've scaled these up really nicely with this large font. And if I go back now to my settings and I'll make it back to being small font, go back, you see that both scale down, both our fonts that are built in and this fixed size font we picked right here. This kind of leads us into the whole topic of accessibility in general, which is making your application as accessible to people with visual impairments and other disabilities as possible. And there is an entire infrastructure in Swift UI for doing this. And uh, I always hope to be able to cover it. And I have covered in some quarters. I'm not going to get to it this quarter. But you should definitely know that it's there. And if you are publishing an app on the App Store and you want it to have a wide audience, just like you'll want to make sure it's available in other languages, you'll want to make sure it's available to people with disabilities as well. All right, let's hop back into the slides and learn more about turning our Emoji Art app here into a multi-document app instead of just having our one auto-saved uh, version of our uh, document here. All right, now that we understand how this scene stuff works with Window Group, we can talk about the document architecture. So the document architecture is based on this thing, document group, which is similar to Window Group, but you can see that it has this extra argument, new document, and it has a little extra argument to its little closure that creates the view for a scene. So let's talk about these two things here. Note that there's no at sign state object anymore for our uh, view models here. Our view model is coming out of that purple thing, that config. And that purple thing really is a simple little struct. It's got our view model. It also has the URL for the file that represents this document. And so each of our scenes, the top level view, is using its own view model, which makes sense, right? We have a different document in each one different things stored on disk, we want to have a different view model for all of them. That's different than we talked about with the previous window group stuff. For window group, we often are sharing a view model, but here we're never going to do that. The other argument there is the blue thing, this new document. That's just a little closure that says how to create a blank document, because we have to be able to start with a blank document before we can create any documents. And that's basically it for the core of our scene building for uh, our document architecture is just to be able to create a new document and then to be able to create a scene based on a view model that represents something on disk. 
So this is that same code again, just with colors taken out. And I just want to emphasize that to make this work though, uh, the view model, whatever our view model is here, has to conform to this thing called reference file document, which is a pretty simple protocol. It's all about putting your document onto disk and getting it off of the disk, as you might imagine. The other thing about reference file document, this view model approach here, is that your app has to essentially implement undo because undo is the way that the document architecture knows that your document has changed and can auto save it. The whole saving mechanism in iOS is based on auto saving your document. There's not a save menu or something like that like you would have on the Mac. So you have to implement undo. Once you do those two things though, then this simple little green code will allow you to have this very sophisticated UI that not only lets you create new documents, but rename documents, move them around to different folders, all inside of your app, which is pretty, uh, pretty powerful. Now, if you didn't want to implement undo, uh, there is a way to do it, but it involves essentially saving your model directly with this document group thing. There's a little different document group for that. And then when you create your view models, you pass in a binding to your model. So I'm not even really gonna talk about this uh, because we're almost certainly not going to do it this way. And it's not really worth it to not have to do undo because undo you usually want it anyway in a document-based app. Uh, but anyway, for this way of doing it to work, now your model is gonna have to conform to a reference file document like thing called file document because now your model is going to have to know how to put itself in and out of disk and you know this is ui stuff we're talking about here and our model is totally ui independent so maybe we would add this conformance to file document uh, via an extension if, we, if possible so again this is pretty rare to ever do things this way i wouldn't even really worry about it now, and one way though that might be interesting for having your model directly stored in your documents is if you have a viewer. So this would be a document opening uh, viewing app where you can't edit it. So it's not like emoji art, uh, but imagine that we just had an app that only let people look at emoji art documents. They couldn't edit them. Well, then you might use this document group version that has the argument viewer. And in the viewer case, again, maybe you would just have the model directly go into the file system uh, because your viewer might really not even need a view model. So this is kind of an odd thing here. We haven't really talked about having views that don't even have view models. Uh, they just kind of get handed a model directly. Uh, that certainly is uh, something you can do. Again, pretty rare to do it that way. Um, and for this code to work, you still would have to have your uh, emoji art model here uh, implement that file document because it has to be able to put itself uh, in, onto disk and back. So what is this file document and reference file document uh, protocol that we're talking about here? So I'm going to talk about the file document one first. This is a one that you implement on a value type, not in a view model. And it's a really simple protocol. It essentially just has an init that gives you this thing called a read configuration, which really is just telling you the file from which you are supposed to read uh, your document. And then there's another function called file wrapper, which is asking you to give it a file wrapper that contains yourself encoded somehow uh, for the file system. In this file wrapper, it's usually just a regular file, just storing a data, a blob of data in there but it can do more sophisticated storage of complicated files. And you can take a look at the documentation if you wanna uh, learn more about that. Now, reference file document is the one that we use with view models, okay? Not value types. And it's very importantly inherits observable object. So only a view model can be a reference file document. And the only difference when you're, it comes to writing out your files between a reference file document and file document is that you are going to do it with a snapshot. This document architecture system is going to ask you when it wants to autosave, please create a snapshot of yourself. And it even asks you this off the main thread in case it would for somehow take a lot of work or something to create that. 
Uh, and this snapshot, you can actually have it be any type you want. Uh, usually we're gonna make it a data because we're eventually gonna have to write this out to the file system, so we might as well make it a data, but it could be something else. You also notice there's this content type of UT type, which is a uniform type identifier. We'll talk about that uh, in just a minute. But you still have the same thing as we had in the file doc document protocol, which is a function file wrapper, which wants you to give it a file wrapper that contains the file. It's just that now it's going to give you that snapshot back, the same one it asks you to go do, but it's going to give it back to you. And now you have to put that snapshot into a file wrapper. Otherwise, it's virtually identical to the file document version. All right, so what about that UT type, that uniform type identifier? Well, there obviously needs to be a way to clearly express what type of file you want to open or edit. And this is done with uniform type identifiers. Now for standard sorts of types like text files, and image files, and things like that, these uniform type identifiers are well known. There are static bars for them in the documentation, uh, easy to use. But if you want to create your own custom document type, like an emoji art document, well, you have to invent a unique UT type for yourself. And we do that using an identifier. It's usually reverse DNS notation. We know from when we created an identifier for our apps that reverse DNS notation is a great way to get a unique identifier. So when we do emoji art, for example, we're going to call our use the identifier here, edu.stanford.cs193p.emojiart. Get pretty much guaranteed to be unique. You describe these custom identifiers in your project settings. I'm going to show that in the demo, so I won't go into detail now, but it's pretty straightforward. You're just going to ex explain what this type is and what file extensions uh, go along with it. And uh, you do, you're going to do that for importing and exporting types. And then you're also going to define uh, this document type, uh, which is really a way of telling the system, yeah, I'm the owner of this document. Uh, type and I'm registering it so that it exists on this particular system so that when your app is installed on an iOS device, well, that document type is understood by the system. There is an app in iOS called the Files app. I, hopefully you've all seen it, but it's a very simple little app, but it's powerful in what it can do. It can look all around your file system on your iOS device and find files to open. And let you rename them and move them to iCloud and do all kinds of stuff. And if you have a document-based app, you want to be able to open your files from the files app. So to do that, you do have to put this one little entry in your info.p list. I think we looked at the info.p list at the very beginning of the quarter, but I don't know that we've actually edited anything in it. Uh, we just need to put this one line in there which says supports document browser, yes. And I'm going to show you in the demo exactly how we're going to do that. It's pretty easy. Now, once you have created this UT type in your info.p list and in your project settings, you still have to do a little bit in your code to uh, let the system know that your reference file document, uh, that this is the type that it opens and saves. And you're going to do that usually by creating your own little static bar or static let for your thing. Like I said, there's standard ones in there for image files and movie files and text files and things like that. But you're going to create one for your thing just by extending UT type and adding a static let uh, in there. And the UT type you want since you export these emoji arts, you save them, is this UT type exported as, and you give that unique reverse DNS identifier. Then in your reference file document, you're going to implement these two statics, which is the array, which each are the array of things that you can either read or write. These are your writable content types and readable content types. And in that array, you're just going to put your little UT type that you just created above with that extension. We'll see all that in the uh, demo as well. Now, I said that you had to implement in undo if you want this reference file document to work because uh, again, that's how it knows that there's something changed in the document. If you have to undo something, well, something must have changed. And so undo is a nice feature to have in general, especially on the Mac, people are really used to using it. But even in iOS, it'd be nice to be able to, well, as you're making your emoji art and you put something out there and, oh, you put the wrong emoji out there, you put it in the wrong place and you just want to undo. Uh, and also you'd like redo too. So we're going to show how to do both of those things.
Now the actual code that makes things undoable usually is going to live in your view model because it's the thing that's implementing intent functions, which are the main things that change your model. And it knows all about the model. And so it's really in a better position to know how to undo a change you made uh, than any, anything else. However, it's your view that knows these, this undo manager thing. So an undo manager is just an object that is, as its name implies, managing undo, keeping track of what undo operations there are. And so that's associated with your view because of course your view is the one that's going to provide any UI for doing undo. And so you got these two things, view model and a view, each has a piece of the puzzle here. And so whenever you do intent functions, call them from your view, you're gonna usually pass along this undo manager. And this undo manager in your view, you get it by getting it from your environment. So there's an at sign environment backslash dot undo manager, our undo manager, and that is going to give you your undo manager. And so that's how the view and the view model will work together to make undo happen. Now, the way you make an operation that you just did, adding an emoji or moving it or resizing something, undoable is by registering an undo for it. This is actually a very elegant and simple system. You have, if you have an undo manager, you can just ask it, please register this block of code to undo whatever I just did. And so it's very open-ended. You can kind of do anything you want to undo. And the register undo function, which is in undo manager, just you specify what object is going to do the undo essentially, and a block of code to do it. Now, how you do undo totally uh, depends on your app and how it does the operations it does. But if you have an application that's architected like EmojiArt, where we have this value type struct EmojiArt model, and then we have the view model that is controlling all access to it via intent, then it's really easy to do undo. And I'm going to show you a fun this function on doably perform when we go to the demo. And it essentially just salts away the current state of the model. Then it does whatever you want to do that's going to change it. And if you want to undo, it just goes back to the previous version of the model. And this leverages heavily on this fact that value types can just be copied around like this with very little uh, effort. We'll see this little uh, function in uh, the demo, and all we need to do is wrap it around anything that might change our model, like our intent functions. Uh, it turns out you can also name undo operations, and that's so that in your undo menu, it'll say something like undo add emoji, undo set, set background, or something like that. It'll, it'll tell the user what the name of the thing that they're undoing is. And as a little trick, you're gonna see, we're actually gonna do that undoing uh, undoably performed so that we get redo. That's all redo is. All right, so let's go take a look at all this in Emoji Art. And uh, you know, this is one where the demo really makes a lot of this stuff become a lot uh, clearer and a lot more understandable. Adding document support to our emoji art is gonna require us to do some coding, obviously. But before we do that, let's go into our project settings and make this emoji art document be a type of thing. We'll make it so that there is such a thing as emoji art document, just like there's the same thing as a JPEG document, essentially a JPEG file. We're gonna have a dot emoji art file. So we do all this in our project settings. We're just gonna to go to this top thing up here it's going to be in the target emoji art. This is the app we're building. And under info, we're going to see that there's these document type, exported type identifiers, imported type identifiers down here. And we just need to fill out these sections to describe to the system what our app type is. We're going to start here with this exported type identifiers. I'm going to do the same thing in exported and imported because we're going to be able to import this type into our app and export it, save it as a document file. And we just go down here and we hit this plus button and the plus button wants to know well, what is this thing? So here's a kind of a description of it. This is just an emoji art document. We'll say description is emoji art. And now it wants that unique identifier, which I told you 
almost always going to do with a reverse DNS notation right here because we need something that is unique. We want to make sure that this emoji art document doesn't get confused with any other custom data document data type that somebody creates. Then these conform tos, this whole uniform type identifier business has a hierarchy to it. And our document here is both raw, stored as raw data, and it's also a document, something that the user considers a document. So it's going to conform to these types. This is really not that important to understand here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining it, but uh, we have generally things that are documents stored as data are going to conform to these two types as well. And then here's the extension. We're going to have ours be .emoji art files. This could be if it was a JPEG file, it would be JPEG or JPEG. Multiple are allowed. See, so it's extensions. Ours is just going to be emoji art. That's all we have to do. Just have to do it twice, unfortunately. Go down here, hit plus, same exact thing. And once we have these universal type identifiers defined here for input and output, now we just need to create this document type, which says that these universal type identifiers represent a document that our application owns. So let's hit plus right here. And when we hit plus, again, it wants to know the name of this thing, emoji art, and the types. And the type right here is our edu.stanford.cs193p.emoji art. So this here, this definitely wants to match this identifier down here. This is how we identify this type. And our handler rank here is owner. We are the owner of this document. We're not just a viewer, like a PDF file or something like that. We actually own this uh, type. And so we are the ones who are going to be registering it on the iOS device and all that. That's all that's really required to get yourself up and going. We have now essentially defined a new document type emoji art. That's what all of our documents are going to be stored as over here. So now we can write our code. And writing our code is pretty straightforward, actually. I'm going to go back to my emoji art documents. This is my view model over here. This is where most of the code that makes my document live on disk and come off of disk, it's going to happen. And that's here now. We have this autosave that we schedule, and we have this autosave file name right here, and we're saving to the file and catching all these errors, and we can load up from our autosave file. And we are going to remove all of this because the Swift UI document architecture is going to do all of this, including handling the errors and saving and auto-saving everything. So we can literally just remove all of this code. Don't need any of this. This can all go away. Uh, even in our init right here, we're not going to be loading up this thing. We just need to be able to create a blank document, essentially. So that has cleaned up our code uh, a lot. And the tiny amount of code we're going to add to turn this all back on for the document architecture is way less than all the stuff we just did right there. So before we do the saving and loading here, let's go back to our emoji art app over here and change our window group to a document group. And when you do the document group, you do have to provide this argument, new document, which is a closure. And this closure knows how to create a new document, which for us, really easy emoji art document. This is creating a view model, which represents our document. Now, the closure that's executed here every time it wants to create a scene, like scene here and scene here, this also is slightly different. Right now, when we create the view for our scene, we use this shared state object up here. This is the truth for the document. And so every scene is having the same document. But when we start using a document group, when we start having different documents in each scene. Instead, we're going to use this little argument config in that is passed to us. And this config is the simplest little struct. It just has the view model we're supposed to use and the URL of the file in question. This emoji our document view now is going to use that configs document, the view model from that config. Now we can see this doesn't compile. What's the error here? It says generic parameter document cannot be inferred. 
The reason for that is it's looking inside this closure to see what kind of document we're creating. And we are creating a document that does not implement a reference file document protocol. So we need to teach our document how to be a reference file document so that the document system can read it in from disk and write it out to disk. All right. So let's go do that. Go back to our emoji art document here. And we're just going to change it to be instead of observable object here. And actually we could add it first, which is reference file document. And reference file document, it inherits the observable object protocol. So we don't really need to specify it twice here, essentially. We can see that this thing is going to be in our way here. So let's get rid of it. So we can see our errors. You can see here it says type emoji art document does not conform to this protocol. Of course, we just said it did, but we didn't actually do any of it. Let's use the fix here to add protocol stubs. And this is going to do something kind of strange you might not expect. So here we go, fix. Oh, interesting. In the slides, we know that reference file document has things like init and snapshot and all that. But when I said add protocol stubs, it just added this one line right here. Well, here it's saying, look, these functions that I want to add for you, they have this don't care. And I want you to tell me what that type is. And the don't care is the type of that snapshot, which, as we said in the slides, is almost always going to be a data. It could be really any type we want here. But making it a data is nice because we're eventually going to have to write this snapshot out to disk. And for that, we're going to need to convert it to a data anyway. Now that is nice, but it, we still have this does not conform because this only defined the type of the don't care. It doesn't actually add the functions. So let's go over here and fix again. Now that it has the snapshot type of data, it can add these functions for us. And by the way, once it added these functions with data as the snapshot type, and we actually don't even need this type alias down here because it can infer the type from the return type of this argument and the argument here. It kind of seems weird that we would have to specify that don't care first, then it generates these. Now we don't have to specify the don't care, but again, it's this type inference that allows that. Now, right away, we see these errors here about cannot find this UT type uh, in scope. So this UT type is the type that represents a uniform type identifier like that emoji art thing we just put in the uh, project settings. So to get this type, we have to import the uniform type identifiers framework. It's the whole framework for handling these type identifiers. And once we do that, now we can create our own custom UT type just for emoji art. If we go look at UT type in the documentation, we'll see that it has a lot of system declared types here movies, audios, MPEG videos, all this stuff. So we want one of these little static lets on UT type for our thing, for emoji art. I'm going to add an emoji art static let to UT type with an extension. Just do this right at the top up here, extension UT type. And it's a static let. We call it emoji art. And it's just going to be a UT type. So I'm going to create a UT type here. And it's exported, it's an exported type as this art. That's its unique identifier. So just like that, we have created a UT type for this emoji art. And we can use that, for example, here in this required var, it's required by reference file document, which wants an array of the types that you can read, for example, in this case. And so sure, UT type dot emoji art. This has a static here, so it is now a static. We're not only able to read emoji art types, we can also write them. So we can say our writable content types also include emoji art. And these bars, again, are part of the reference file document protocol. It's just allowing people who are looking at our document to know the types that we read and write. So we're almost done. All we have to do is implement these three little functions right here. Let's start with the snapshot. How do we represent this document, this emoji art document, as a data? Take a snapshot of it as a data. 
super easy in our case. We're just going to return an emoji art.json. And this throws, so we want to try it. And this throws, so it'll just rethrow. Similar to when we were write, reading and writing this on our own, things were rethrowing, and that's perfectly fine. So now that we know how to create a snapshot right here, we can go down to our file wrapper and write it out by just creating a file wrapper. This file wrapper is just going to have a regular file with contents being that snapshot that the system made for us at some point. So the way this works with autosaving is you're working in your emoji art document and it detects, oh, something's changed and we need to save it. So it's going to call this snapshot function on our document on another thread, by the way, not in the main thread. So if this was a complicated thing to do, which ours is not, but if it were complicated, that would be fine. It could take a little bit of time, be off the main thread. And then it's going to ask you again, give me a file wrapper that I can put this thing in. And file wrapper, again, usually it's just a regular file with some contents, this data object, but it could be more complicated, a folder with files in it. You can go look at the documentation. And yes, I'm just, returning that here. That is the return value of this. I don't need return here. I actually don't need it here as well. Amazingly, we've only added two lines of code and we're almost done. All we have to do now is to be able to initialize our document from something called a read configuration. And this read configuration pretty much is just a specifier uh, that has the file that we want to open. So I'm going to try and get the data out of that file by saying, if I can let data, equal that configurations file dot regular file contents. Again, I don't usually use the wrapper stuff to do it. That's the data, I just pulled it right out of there. If I can do that, then I'm gonna set my emoji art, my model equal to an emoji art model with the JSON of that data. And of course, again, this initializer throws, so we need to try it. This all Looks good, but we have a return error here because what happens if this if let data comes back nil? This regular file the content is there's no data in there. Well, that's some kind of corrupted emoji art file. There should never be no data in there. So in this case, I'm going to say otherwise throw an error. Now we have not seen throwing our own errors. We've only been trying things that could rethrow, but now we're going to throw a particular error. And when you're throwing an error, there's really kind of a cool errors available to you, which are cocoa errors. And cocoa errors, you just specify a code. I'm going to use the file read corrupt file code because that's what we're doing. We're reading some sort of corrupt file. Let's go take a look at cocoa errors though and see what other stuff is available. Quite a bit of stuff formatting problems, files, the problems with the network, URL problems, validation problems, the data is no good, that kind of stuff. And these are all things that Coco, Coco, by the way, is another name for the underlying library that's uh, basically iOS is built upon and includes both the old way of doing things and we can use this in Swift UI as well. And so these are things it throws and we just wanna throw something similar, which is that we read a corrupt file here. So that completely reads and writes our file. There is one other thing we want to do. When we create a new emoji art, we want to make sure that we fetch its background image data if it needs to be fetched from the internet. So it's build. No errors. Everything works since we're a reference file document. All this document group stuff has cleaned up. It says, oh yeah, no problem. This is a reference file document. I know how to create a new one. I know how to pass one off to the view. It's all excellent, good. I don't need this, by the way, this state object because I'm not using that anymore. But we still do need our palette store because we're sharing our palette store amongst all of our documents. You're gonna see that's kind of a cool feature as well. Let's run, see what this looks like. And we can see right away that our app looks completely different. Let's just go full screen with our app. And it, it's got this nice way of choosing files here. Click this to create a new document. I can create them on iCloud Drive if I set up iCloud on this device. 
Yeah, I can use tags. I can do all the things I can do to manage my files. And we'll see a whole bunch of stuff up here we can do. And, and this is all built into my app now. This is emoji art. You see, there's says emoji art. So let's create a new document. Tap that. Here it is. It called it Untitle. Even gave it a nice icon if you saw briefly right there. We can do all the things we normally do. Let's go grab our Safari here. Pull out a nice image. How about this is our favorite image right here? Well, let's do something different so we can see it. How about this guy right here? Sorry, the image, and we could find something nice to throw out there. It'll be our rocket ship going to this alien planet here. Notice that it's given our document that name untitled. And if we click here, it'll go back to where we choose documents. But unfortunately, watch something here. We got a nice rocket, go back. Oh yeah, here's our documents. There's untitled.emojiart. We're over here, by the way, we can press and hold. And for example, rename it. We want to call this alien emoji art. We can reopen it by just clicking on it. Oh no, it's completely blank. I lost my background and there's no rocket. Oh, it didn't save the document. But where's the save button? I, I don't see any save button. Well, on iOS, there is no save button. It auto saves. But it doesn't know this document changed. When we dragged out this background and when we then dragged out this rocket, so we did not tell this anything to the system, hey, this document changed. And the way we do that is with undo. We're gonna register to be able to undo these things, undo the setting of the background, undo adding an emoji to our document right here. And if something's undoable, then the document must have changed in some way. So now we're gonna learn a whole nother system, which is a really simple system to use, which is undo. We're gonna add undo to our emoji art document here. Our emoji art document has actually kind of gotten quite simple, especially if we remove some of this commented out stuff, the old GCD way of doing uh, the backgrounds. Really, it's just this tiny little bit of code to read and write the file, a little bit of code to use these, this publisher to go fetch the background image, and then our intents. That's all that's left in our document. I'm gonna add another section down here, mark, called undo. This is going to have the section that does undo inside of our document. Just like I talked about in the slides, I'm going to add a little helper function that I can use throughout my uh, document here to do undo. I'm going to call it private func undoably perform. And undoably perform, undoably performs with an undo manager. This undo manager is the center of the entire world of doing undo. I'll allow you to have a nil undo manager, in which case this won't actually perform undoably. You just provide the thing you want to do undoably. And we'll have it just be a little closure right here. It takes no arguments and returns nothing. And it's gonna do this in a way that is undoable with this undo manager. And for our document, that's so simple. If we look at our document, it really only has our emoji art here as its only state. These background image and fetch status, these are temporary things that it can recreate at any time. We can always refetch our background image. So the only state in our document is our model. And that's commonly the case that you'll have a view model and its only state is its model. So all we need to do is hold on to that state for a moment old emoji art equals my emoji art. And I'm going to do this undoable thing. And I'm going to register with the undo manager to be able to undo that thing we just did. It's really simple to do. You want to always register for undo with a target. And the target is just the object that can do the undo, which is us. And it passes that thing back to ourselves. So we're getting myself back. I'm just going to say myself dot emoji art equals the old emoji art. And that will definitely undo whatever we did here. All right? We grabbed our model, made a copy because this is a value type. So setting it equal, copied it into there here. We did undo and we go inside here. And if we 
do actually have to do an undo, then we just go back to the old way. Could not be any simpler. We want uh, our undos to be named though, so that our menu items on Mac can say like undo add emoji or undo set background. So I'm gonna add another argument here, operation, which is just gonna be a string. I'm gonna use that as the undo managers action name, action name, the operation. And while I'm here, I'm gonna do one other thing, which is I'm gonna implement redo. So this does undo very nicely. I'm gonna do redo by just having this undo be undoable. That's what redo is. We're just gonna have myself undoably perform. Again, it's the same operation, which is redoing it with this same undo manager, and what we're going to have it do is this. So now I've just implemented redo by having my undo be undoable. This is a really nice little function that we can now use everywhere that we change our model to make sure that that change is undoable. So where do we change our model? Well, we change it in our intent functions. That's what our intent functions are all about, really, is the user intends the model to change. Well, that's what these all are. So all of my intent functions, I'm going to have them undoably perform whatever they're going to do. And so each one will have an operation. This is like set background. That's what's going on in this one. And we have to have the undo manager. And we'll talk about how we're going to get that in a second. And we can do this same exact thing on all of these. This one would be add emoji. And down here, we're moving the emojis around. So we will undoably perform move. And down here, we are scaling the emojis. So we'll say scale. So that's great, but we don't actually have an undo manager here. And there's no undo manager anywhere in our document. And in fact, our document cannot really have an undo manager. The entity that has an undo manager in SwiftUI is the views. Okay, the views have the undo manager. Each view has its own little undo environment that it's undoing things in that view. So this undo manager is going to have to be passed to us in the document. No problem, I'll just make an undo manager argument to all of these things. And I'll let you pass nil if you want. And if you pass nil, that just means it's not going to be undoable. And it looks like I've misspelled this. So let's say undoably perform. No errors, everything's fine. We just have to go into our emoji art document view and every place we call an intent, we're gonna to have to pass this undo manager. Let's go do that. Emoji art document, if we build over here, we are gonna see errors here. If we scroll down, we'll see that everywhere we're calling an intent function, we now are having to pass this undo manager argument. So I'm gonna to have to have some undo manager variable somewhere in my uh, emoji art document view. So where am I gonna get my undo manager? The undo manager for a view is in its environment, this at sign environment. So way up here at the top, I'm going to just add an at sign environment. It is my undo manager, that's the key for it. I'll call it undo manager. The document group knows about this undo manager and it's watching that undo manager to see if things change and that's how it knows how to save auto save our document no errors all is well i've got my undo manager out of my environment i'm passing it along here to my document my view model and my view model is then using it to undoably perform each of the intents and undoably perform is just saving the model doing that thing and registering to undo it by going back. That's all we need to do to make things undoable. So now let's see our app in action here. Can open our alien emoji art, nothing in there because it was not saving before. Let's go set a background right now. There it is. And let's go back and get our rocket ship. Now, 
should save this because it knows that those things were undoable actions. And you can actually, if you notice, this number changed from 47 bytes to 216, so it actually changed our document. If we go back, eh, there it is, it's remembering things. We will put a truck on this alien landscape here and go back from 216 now to 265, saved. You can go here and create a new document, untitled. Let's put a different background on this one. We will have an airplane flying across the sky here. Go back, there's untitled, it's now 150 bytes. We can go back and forth between our alien emoji art and our untitled over here. And of course we could change the name of this if we wanted to. This document architecture not only lets you keep track of all your files and such over here, but we can save our files on iCloud Drive if we want. I haven't set up iCloud on this uh, simulator. Each simulator, by the way, has its own little iCloud sign up that you have to do. And it does all this for us. None of this matters to our app. We just need to be able to save and load our documents. And the document group takes care of everything for us. There's only two more things I want to show here. Uh, one quickly is I want to show you the Files app. I don't know if you've seen the Files app. Here it is on iPad. It looks quite similar to what we saw in our app. We've got our documents here, and it would have actually documents from all apps could be in here. But what we really want in this Files app, which is a different app, just to be clear, it's a different app than our emoji art. Here's emoji art, here's this files app. We wanna be able to click on this and have it open in emoji art. But it's not doing that, right? It's just saying, oh yes, you have a flight document emoji art, 150 bytes. To allow the files app, the authority to open your documents, and also, by the way, to look in the documents directory inside your app, you need to put a little thing in your info.p list, right? Here's the info.p list of my app. And you add this by going right click and add row. And if you scroll down pretty far, it's alphabetical. So we're going down to support. Right here, supports document browser. And we're going to change this to yes, we do support document browser. Now, when we run, a couple of things are going to change here. One is, now we can see our document directory. See this is emoji art folder. That is the documents directory. And if we look in there, ah, there's that auto saved. Remember we were auto saving before that was going in our document directory. That was not lost. We can actually go back here and look at it. Here it is. Zoom. I recognize this from earlier today. So that's kind of cool. But also we can go to the files app over here and it also can see in our documents directory. So we can click in the files app here and we can see our documents here as well. Now the last little thing I wanna do is we have undo here. We have the ability to undo. And so I'd like to be able to use that in my UI. And there's a number of different ways to put undo in. This is a demo and we're running late on time again. So I'm gonna do a simple undo where I'm just gonna have a button in my corner of my uh, bar up here that I'd click on it and it'll undo. Just so you can see that undo is actually being re registered and it is happening here. But let's go to our document view. And in our main part of our view, this is right, main document body here, I'm gonna add a toolbar item. Saw this before. In my toolbar, I'm gonna to put an undo button. I'll show you what that is uh, in a second. And this undo button has the title of the undo part of it, which is my undo managers optional undo menu item title and the redo item, which is my undo managers optional redo menu title. So both these two vars on my undo manager, I added those with an extension and this, are added in this utility stuff. So let's go look at our utilities view. Here it is, the undo button. Undo button, it's a really simple button. It's going to do undo if it can. So if it can undo, it's gonna do undo. Otherwise it'll do redo. And it's also got a context menu that you can press and hold. And if you can undo, it'll show you the 
full undo add emoji or whatever. And if you can redo, it'll show you the redo add emoji. So it shows you it all if you want by pressing, but otherwise a simple tap will undo or redo. And here's the extension where I added this optional undo menu item title. Undo menu item title is just a var in my undo manager, which tells me the menu item title. But here I'm going to return nil if I can't undo. So that's all I've done. That's why I call it my optional undo menu title. It just becomes nil if I can't undo. So that way back here, when I'm passing it to my undo button, what the undo and redo menu items are, that they go in as nil if I can't undo or can't redo. Let's see this. Open up our uh, alien emoji art here. Let's zoom in a bit. Let's add something else. How about a helicopter on the alien planet here? And now, see, an undo button appeared here. If I click this, oh, it undoes. And now it redoes. And I could put a nice alien spaceship on the alien planet. Again, I can re undo, undo, redo, redo, undo, redo. Also, I can press and hold and now redo the adding of the spaceship or press and hold and undo the adding of the spaceship. And these strings undo, add and redo, add, those are the things that we added over here in our emoji art document when we undoably performed an operation. We specified add that emoji. This is the string, right? Because we set it with set action name that is appearing here in the UI when we press and hold. And if we were on the Mac, this right here would be in the menus. Have the edit menu, we'd have undo and redo, and it would show the text in there as well. You can go back and take a look at this undo button code later, and hopefully you can understand what we're doing with the undo manager. When the undo manager wants to undo and redo, it's just calling undo and unredo on the undo manager. Nothing else going on there. It's real easy. Okay, that is it for this week. And uh, next week, we are going to just do a little bit of finish up on emoji art. We can get it working on the Mac, hopefully, and on the iPhone and see what's required to do this multi-platform support. It'll be the primary thing we're doing next week. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.